Welcome to the Really to Below 7 podcast for this special behind the camera interview with Oscar winner Norman Wanstall, who is here with us today. So it's uh, lovely to see Norman. Now, Norman's had a, an amazing career in sound editing. He worked on all of Sean Connery's James Bond films. So, yes, that includes Never Say Never Again, yes. which he came out of retirement for, all the way back from where Bond started in 1962. So, one of the, the original greats who made the series. So, in incredible to just be in his company. Now, we do have other interviews you can watch on our YouTube channel. Just go to Really 007 Pod at uh, YouTube. We're also on iTunes and Spotify and all social media channels such as Facebook, Twitter and Instagram where you can follow us and interact with Bond fans from all over the world. Now, I'm Tom Pickup and I've got uh, my friend John Kell here with me today. And we're just, yeah, we're fascinated to hear more about the world of sound editing, the world of editing. Sure. Because a lot of people you know, would, would sort of know that these jobs exist, but they don't know how to create the sounds, they don't know what's involved, the editing process. So I don't know, I don't know, Norman, could you sort of explain what, what it is to be, first of all, a sound editor? What does that job entail? <clears throat> yes, basically, most people, if ever I give a talk, I always take with me uh, a roll of film and a roll of sound, because most people don't actually take in the fact that the sound and picture are totally separate. And... Um, that's that's very very important because it means that if you went onto a film set and you see the camera crew lining up the shot, you know, way over the other side there would be the sound man there with his t tapes, and in the evening the, the negative that they shot all day would go off to the laboratory, the tapes would go into the sound department. The following morning the film would come back on thirty five, and the sound would come back on thirty five. They'd put those tapes onto 35 mil stock. So now you've got these two rolls of film that will go together now all the way through the making of the film. If you go into a, a viewing theater, picture goes on the projector, sound goes on a sound machine, switch, and the two start to roll. Which means that the soundtrack is completely available for people that want to decide whether or not which parts of the soundtrack are worthy of the final film and which really aren't and they will have to be replaced. So what happens is, at the end of shooting, there's no point before the end of shooting, at the end of shooting, on a film the size of Bond, you would bring on two sound effects editors, or they're called dubbing editors. Now, there are some films which are very talky pictures indoors. You don't need two. One guy could cope or one girl could cope with it all but on bomb films of course there's so much going on so what we used to do was to have one editor sound editor that would only deal with the dialogue they would bring the actors back into into a recording theater for lines that weren't suitable or weren't worthy and they would re-record the dialogue with the actor until it was in sync Whereas the sound effects editor would only concentrate on all the guns and the cars and the helicopters and the special noises and things like that. And that's those two are always in touch, but they work very, very independently. And the only reason I was given the chance to do this job, which was quite remarkable, really, was, as you probably know, that Dr. No's budget was so ridiculous. That everybody looks back now and thinks, how did they make that film yeah. for one and a half million dollars? Yeah, yeah. With those incredible sets. No, Ken oh, Adam, yeah. how he did. <laughs> but anyway, cut a long story short, Peter Hunt said, Norman, I'm awfully sorry, mate, but we can't afford two sound editors. You worked on three major pictures with one of the finest sound editors in the country. I know you've never done any sound editing, but we're going to have to make you the effects sound effects editor, and we will bring on someone to do the dialogue. And so uh, fr from then on, I went into my own room with my own assistant, and I had to just copy what I learned from the man that I worked with before. <laughs> yeah. So who, who's, the, who's the chap you learned from then? His name was Winston Ryder. Right. His credits were incredible. Bridge on the River Choir, wow. Lawrence yeah. of Arabia. <laughs> uh, <laughs> wow. And the interesting thing is he never, ever called me across and said, Norman, look, this, this is the way you... He never once did that on three major films. But I used to watch what he did, and I learned the actual principles of how he t t took on a major film. And, of course, the third film that we worked on was Sink the Bismarck, which was yes. edited by Peter Hunt. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. The rest is history. Because you, 
No, go Is on. that how you got to know Peter Hunt through that film? Initially? Yes, it was. Oh. Yes, because we're all working as a team, even yeah. though I wasn't on his side of it. And towards the end of the picture, I realised that his assistant was going to move on to a job in London. And I thought, wow, what a chance to get back to film editing rather than sound. So I approached him and he said, fine, that'll be great. I felt rather sorry letting Wynne down, but I think he realised that you know, that's the way it works. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so how was Peter? What, what was he like as a, as a gentleman? Peter and I became a really, really strong team. We were like, you know, father and son, really. Oh, right. And we worked on about four major features before he was lucky enough to be given Dr. No. Yeah. And I respected him greatly, and he respected me. I mean, I was a young single guy. When he went home, I'd stay behind and make sure everything was put back the way it was. We, we were a really, really good team. And uh, uh, the fact that he had the confidence to give me Dr. No is, proves it all, really. Yeah. Because yeah. he, he's one of the people we see as one of the great starting blocks of Bond. Absolutely. So you have, you have him, you have Ken Adam, Terence Young, John Barry... And these people have, I don't, it, it's a shame almost that at some point they have to leave the franchise and move on. So when, when you started uh, on Doctor No, could you, could you sort of tell us how you, you came to be chosen? Was it Peter just recommending you? Was that how it was done? No, no, we, we were a team. I, I had assisted him. I was now his assistant. Ah, yes. We had two assistants. I was his first assistant, then we had another guy who was the second assistant. And the second assistant's the one that synchronises all the rushes every morning because, you know, these two roles arrive and you don't know where they sleep. I assisted him for, I, I'm sure it was four films before Dr. Noah arose. And so we automatically went on it together. Right. And I remember him saying to me when he started to see the rushes, he said, Norman, I think that the only way we're going to make this film really work is we've got to keep it moving. We've got to make it moving so fast. No one stops to analyse anything. Let's keep it moving. And so he established that style of yeah, editing. Yeah, yeah. Any chance he had of moving slightly quicker, getting someone through a door a little bit yeah, faster, yeah. <laughs> he did it. And I think every editor from then on uh, followed that pattern, followed yeah. that style of editing. John Glenn's told us that. He, he learnt a lot through Peter Hunt. Ah, and, of course, there we he are. brought him in for Honor Majesties, so it's... Like a family that develops, isn't it? That's so right. They keep going. That's right. It's yes. like culture, isn't it? That's yeah. like being bred through it. It's so good. And when I think he b began to feel that they were going to give him a chance to direct, I feel that because we reached the point where I noticed he was spending more time on the set. And so he used to say to me, look, Norman, you can assemble the film, which was like... <laughs> 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 you could, you assemble that scene and I'll, I'll be on the set, I'll come back. He, he used to say that assembling a film wasn't really what he wanted to do. He liked the fine cutting, you know, that last little frame here. So for the very first time, I had a chance to actually feel what it was like to sit on a movie owner and cut shots together. I learned a lot from that. So uh, that was invaluable for me when I eventually got my chance. My word. Well, you, you'd already worked, hadn't you, with Harry Saltzman and Cubby Broccoli on those earlier pictures. It was the Call Me Buana. Oh. Yeah, yeah. I forgot Call Me Buana. Yeah. <laughs> that was after Doctor No, though, wasn't it? I think it was. Was yeah. it after Doctor Because okay. the poster was on the front yes, of the was on, one. Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty yeah. certain it was. Yeah. 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 Quick, he's coming. many deaths. She should have kept her mouth shut. Yeah, it was just like a team, really, wasn't it? The same yeah. people worked on the same films. Um, people always ask me what I thought about the two men, but because we were backroom people, I never really had much chance to get to know either yeah. of them, to be honest. Yeah. I got the feeling that Cubby was like the father figure, whereas Harry was more of, you know, into himself. You couldn't really yeah. track that. <laughs> So how much interaction did you have with the set and, and that kind of thing? Virtually none at all. No. So no. it was all, you saw all the footage for the first time 
when it was coming in and you heard each, all the, each day the, the rushes the rushes uh, it was always a nice uh, thing about the rushes is that the whole crew um plus us all came together in a theatre to watch yesterday's oh. filming oh. and it was a very nice feeling you know yeah. I, I used to enjoy that so that was Pinewood, wasn't it? Pinewood. Pinewood. This was, yeah. Yeah. So just tell us, going back to the beginning, how did you get involved in the industry? It was at Pinewood, wasn't it? It was, yes. It was pure luck, really, because I, I went to a co-educational school and there was a, a girl there I became sort of friendly with and her mother had a very big job at Pinewood. She was the assistant to the production controller. That right. was her title. <laughs> And she said to her daughter one day, uh, she said, look, school holidays are coming up. Get a couple of friends and I'll take the three of you around the studio That's for a day. That's amazing. And I was one of those friends. And, of course, for a 14-year-old boy to go 14? around the film studio, I mean, we were passionate about film. We didn't have television and stuff like that. Saturday mornings, they laid on films purely for youngsters, Saturday morning pictures. We love we love film, and and that day stayed in my brain forever because wow. not only did I absorb the atmosphere of walking down the corridor with film stars going by and all these photographs on the wall, and and the women were so coolly dressed, you know, in trousers and things around their neck. But the highlight, I don't know if you've ever stood outside a film studio, but what what makes it different from any other factory are these massive rectangular buildings called stages. Yeah. They are absolutely huge. There's no windows, rectangular, uh, absolutely enormous, and probably it would have stage A, stage B, or stage one, stage two. And when you go inside, they're completely empty, apart from the fact that when you look up, there are all these strips going across, which are for holding the lights. And she took us onto one of these, because normally there's a thing on the wall saying, forbidden to <laughs> enter, you know, because you're intruding on someone's shooting. But anyway, because of who she was, she took us on, and they were making a film called Hell Below Zero. And it was pitch black, and right at the end, I could see this light, and we got closer and closer and closer. And then I could see these people sitting around watching this ship's cabin, great big ship's cabin, and standing, rehearsing his lines, was our hero, Alan Ladd. <laughs> oh, yeah. Wouldn't yeah. mean much to me, you, Alan Ladd, but to us, he was a big, big star, big Western. Yeah. And he was rehearsing his lines, and I kept thinking to myself, A, I can't believe I'm seeing Alan Ladd, and B, how did they get this, this massive um, cabin into this building? But when there was a break, I just wandered around the back, and of course, it was all scaffold poles and bits of wood. And I yeah. thought, the whole thing is fantasy. This is a wonderful industry. You know, it's make believe and movie magic. And I was totally, totally, totally hooked. And cut a long story short, when my national service was over, yes, yeah. I had decided it was five years since God. I saw that, that set. I, I thought there was no harm done. I could just ring and uh, send her a letter, which I did. How the people enter the film industry. And to my amazement, after all those years, she wrote back and said, "Norman, come and come and meet me." And we had a chat, and she said, "We are short of someone in the editing department." Didn't I didn't know what that meant? And she took me into this tiny room with a bloke in the corner running film through a machine, and I thought, "This isn't quite what I had in <laughs> mind." Actually, I, I imagined <laughs> cameras and sound crews and stuff, but anyway. She said, you know, have a try, see what you think. And slowly but surely, every time they gave me the film to take up to the uh, projection box because they were having a running, I could see the film was getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And then I realised that this is where they were actually assembling the picture. This was the... And I became quite hooked on the whole idea of somebody yeah. cutting all those shots together because when, when you see rushes... And every scene is taken from so many different angles and yeah. somebody has to decide when and where you will be on which shot. And I became intrigued on the whole skill of doing that. So whose decision are those things where That's the, the, the shot. picture's coming? Yeah, like, we'll choose this shot. Do, do they how much influence on what uh, sound effects is, is used? Do they sort of say, can you use this one or 
I'd like you to produce this sound for this. Oh, but at that stage, all they're all you're concentrating on is cutting the film together. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's got nothing to do with sound. Right. The sound people don't come on until the film's completed. Otherwise, they keep saying, well, you didn't tell me you were going to do that. Right, OK. But once they can see an assembled film, it's nothing like the final film. But you, you, yeah. Usually about a week after the end of shooting, you have got an assembled production and the director the editor and various other people sit back and think well what have we got and then you then from then on you start to whistle it down oh. and that's when the sound editors come on because they can then now that's the whole film and they can work their way through reel by reel deciding what's good enough for the final film and what isn't yeah and what isn't they know they've got to start replacing it's absolutely fascinating so it's like you're sprinkling the final bit of magic on it. It's almost like the icing on the cake kind of thing in some ways, would you say? Ah, but don't forget we're talking about bomb films here. So many films, you're just put, replacing sound that everybody knows will be on there, you know? <laughs> yeah. But with bonds, uh, there are sounds which normally you wouldn't ever, ever heard before. Uh, and this was why Dr. No was quite tough, because... Uh, um, the, the, all the films starting to move slightly into the futuristic idea yeah, with yeah. gadgets and flying hats and things <laughs> and, and wheels turning that you've never normally would yeah, see. Yeah. But the the sound industry was still lagging behind. Mm. And but you could go to sound libraries, sound effects libraries, and have a list. Most of the things you would find there, but once it became electronic, well, no, we haven't got anything quite like that. And purely by chance, I heard that somebody said, have you heard about the BBC Radiophonic Workshop? And I, I hadn't. And they said, well, they said, no. Well, what it is, they've set them up to try and develop music that would suit space-type films, you know, mm. so that it's not the usual sort of violins and things, yeah. but more war-type <laughs> things. And I thought, well, hey, that sounds interesting. Yeah, it does, yeah. And on uh, Goldfinger, when he's strapped out onto the um, onto this platform and they're going to bring the beam down... Oh, yeah. I do have a new toy, but considerably more practical. You are looking at an industrial laser which emits an extraordinary light, not to be found in nature. It can project a spot on the moon, or at closer range, cut through solid metal. I will show you. I started the beam with a, with a, um, a shot, you know, firework going off, and then I wanted a sound for that beam, and I could hear it in my mind, but library said, no, I've got nothing like that. So anyway, I called the, these people, the guy came down, he looked at it, and he went away, and a week later, exactly the right sound came back. Peter was a bit nervous about it. He thought it was probably a little bit strong on the ears. But everybody else said, no, that's a fantastic sound. Oh, wow. Whether it's still in the film, I'm not sure. But I think the last time I saw I wasn't too sure. <laughs> right, okay. oh, it was a whip crack. A whip crack set it off, and then you had this steely sound. So I thought, well, these people are wonderful. You know, at least you know that there's always an outlet if you're really stuck. And you only live twice. Oh. They had this rocket descending into the volcano and also taking off. Yeah. And I knew that that would take, oh, so much work. Where would I start with a thing like that, you know? So I called them in and I said, I'll tell you what, look, you just make one basic sound that covers it and then I'll add and subtract. And they said, okay, fair enough. And when it came back, it was the complete sound. Oh, lovely. I just sat back and said, fine, wound it in. And I always remember Peter Hunt said, I'm crazy about the rocket sound. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought, I wish I could say, well, you know, I did it. <laughs> but I didn't. But that's how valuable it was. Yeah. Whereas in Doctor No, without doubt, I have never known tension like I had on Doctor No. Because okay. The most difficult sound of all, I, I, I managed to, with the uh, mixer, build all the difficult sounds first. This is what I learned from Winston Ryder. Look at the film, pick out all the challenges, 
get them done early so that when you're dubbing, you don't have to stop them and say, I've got to make this sound. It's already there. So I did it in, on Dr. No. I did the electronic doors in Dr. No's mm. yeah, apartment. Yeah. Here we are. Your room, Mr. Bond. Don't hesitate to ring if there's anything else you want. Anything at all. Such as two air tickets to London. Mm. I'll leave you two dear people in peace. I did the sound of the lift when they go in there. I didn't want it to sound like Marks and Spencer's. <laughs> 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 I did, when he was in the tunnel, I did the water oh, those crashing. Are amazing that noises, is yeah. the most iconic sound. When I think of Dr. No, that's the sound I think of that film. Yeah. water crashing and that electronic oh. kind of yeah, yeah that yeah. sound while he's in the tunnel how amazing yeah there's just a lot of it which is unscored in 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 that scene it is all sound design sound effects yes and it's, it really sells oh, the scene oh not covered with music was it no no, no. no thing I made was the crushing of the when oh, Dr. Yeah. No crushes that that's my favourite sound of all time oh. yeah. <laughs> you persist in trying to provoke me Mr. Bond I could have had you killed in the swamp and why didn't you I thought you less stupid usually when a man gets in my way but no I was in the <laughs> sound effects library and I was just going through my list and suddenly I heard this sound that you heard yeah i said what's that over there they said oh don't worry no it's just they're going through some electronics i said yeah i know but that is an amazing sound i said I, immediately i thought of him in that tunnel yeah and yeah. it had that twang when he drops and i thought oh. fantastic that is i so I, I said well i'll have a copy copy of that and i took it back and i knew they had music so i thought well i can't lay it lay it up and say this is what i'm doing i just said this is um, a possibility. And that'd be known to me when they were mixing it, they didn't like the music and they said, has Norman got anything? And they looked oh. at the chart and they said, oh, well, and to my joy, they played it. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah. That really made my day. But anyway, back to my, my attention. Yes, yeah. I went through and got all the sound, but the one thing I could not do was find a machine for when he Bond goes onto the gantry and oh, turns that wheel. Yeah, yeah. Such a such a vital sound because it it was it was the nuclear reactor and so it affected the whole of the end of the film. Yeah. And I kept looking for a machine that not only if I switched it on it would go one 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 one, but also <laughs> perhaps a control that would raise the pitch. Yes. Yeah. And they were going through the dubbing. They'd gone through. I think there were twelve reels. They'd reached reel eleven, and I still hadn't got sound. And I was absolutely petrified. Mm. Because not only was my reputation, but the film was at stake. Anyway, in desperation, I went to the guy who was responsible for maintaining all the sound equipment, all the electronic sound equipment and everything. And uh, I said, I told him the problem. I said, is there any chance you could come up with anything? He said, well, not really, but I'll give it some thought. And about two or three days later, he called me to the recording theatre and I looked, and I could not believe <laughs> this bit of gadgetry was so ridiculous. You know, bits of this, bits of that. I said, oh. He said, no, no, hold on. <laughs> he said, switch it on. I switched it on. And it was going, wah, 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 wah. I said, oh, oh. but. He said, no. <laughs> and he gave me another one. He said, turn that. And I turned it, and it went, wah, 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 wah. Oh. <sighs> I'm getting hot <laughs> thinking about it. Oh. And everyone in the theatre said, that is unbelievable. You have invented a machine. Yes. Yeah. yeah. 
to this day, I don't know how he did it. That's incredible. Saved isn't it? my life and my reputation. Yeah. <laughs> so the sound designer they they create and suggest, and then you do you suggest I want this sound to create? No, the the, 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 the sound is up to me. Right. And I just have to hope that whatever I create, they approve of. Right. Okay. Right. Yes, and it was interesting that sounds are so important on Bond because yeah. at Pinewood Studios. The head mixer there, the one that mixed everything together, his name um, was McCullum, Gordon McCullum. And he had a temper like nothing. I mean, <laughs> if he, things weren't going right, he would storm out and everyone kept quiet. And he, I was more nervous about working with, with um, Gordon than I was any other aspect of it. But anyway, unbeknown to me, when the first cut was finished, they showed it to the sound department. And uh, I was in my room and I heard a tap on my door. And when I opened it, Gordon McCullum was standing there like a little boy. He said, when are we going to start? <laughs> <laughs> and he knew that I would be having to create all those different sounds. He knew that, you know, and he wanted to, he couldn't wait to get his hands on my ingredients because when you go in there with about six different tracks to create one sound, it's fascinating. You try three with two, four with one, six with this, and eventually you say, that's the best, we've got it, we've made it, and then he makes it. And he knew he was looking forward to that, and we, we had those lovely sessions, and we worked as a team from then on. It was great. You mentioned Dr. No crushing the, you know, can, can you tell us how that was done with his glove? That. <laughs> well, obviously, I can't remember all the different no, tracks, no. <laughs> but, but obviously the first one would have been a, a, a beer can. Oh, right, okay. Make a start with that. And th there were two or three sounds. But what I love about it is when he drops it and it hits the table, it goes bang, yes. and then when it hits the floor, it goes bang. And I think, Norm, how did you, how did you do that? What did you use for that? Because it showed how th threatening it was and how amazing that he could crush it. It was that yeah, heavy. Yeah, yeah. But as Gordon said, on a bomb on these films we can contribute sound wise rather than just compliment. Yes, yeah. Mm. Most most pictures you just compliment, you know, if, if there's a door closed, you put a door closed. But in the bonds, there were times when we actually I was on a TV program once. I've forgotten the lady's name now, but she had a series, and on this, this particular one it was about awards. And I, I, I went on it, and, and she said, I introduced Norman one so I said, when you throw a hat in the air, this is the sound it makes. This is what it makes when Norman does it. <laughs> <laughs> and she showed this shot. Of, and, you know, the whole place applauded. Oh, it's amazing. Brilliant. Yeah. And that's the odd job. The odd job's odd amazing job. bowler hat. Yeah. Yeah. Then she rang the... Ran the one with the turning of the thing. Okay. Turning yeah, of yeah. the wheel and no one made a sound. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to them, that's what you do. I mean, that's what it did. <laughs> when you turn that wheel, it makes that noise. End of story. <laughs> but you do, you as viewers, you just accept that that is the correct noise. Yes, definitely. definitely. If, if you don't notice it almost, that's good. If you thought, this doesn't sound like the right sound for whatever's happening on screen, then that's a problem, isn't it? Yes, you're, you're it right. It needs to sound what you imagine that thing to be like. You couldn't have said it. You couldn't have said it more accurately because my pride in Goldfinger is the crushing, the crushing. Oh of yeah, the car. The car. Yes, yeah. Because the sound came back up in sort of bits and pieces, mm. I started right from scratch. I thought, yeah, I, I think I could do this very well. But what I was missing was the most important sound of all, which was these jaws coming up, yeah. doing yeah. the crushing and going back. And I thought, come on, Norman, you've got a problem here. Where are you going to get a machine that will make that sort of sound? And anyway, I was working one day, and uh, I said to my assistant, what's going on outside? She said, oh, don't worry, they're uh -huh. doing some maintenance on the <laughs> car park. I said, yeah, but listen. And I could hear this. I rushed out. <laughs> I said, what's this machine? They said, oh, it's, um, oh, they, they told me what it was. But 
I said, don't go anywhere. Stay where you are. Oh. I rushed back to find my sound mixer. He said, Norman, I'm sorry, mate. I can't come. I said, we're, um, we're, we're going to be shooting up for the rest of the day. I said, well, give me a machine and I'll have a, I'll, I'll, I'll record it. He said, I haven't gotten it. I said, well, what's that? He said, oh, you can't have that. That's a toy recorder I bought for my son. <laughs> I said, well, does it record? He said, well, it records, but it's a toy. I said, well, give it to me. <laughs> I rushed back and the, the, the mic was about that size and I tried to look very professional <laughs> and I recorded it and laid it all up, you know, and I put it on the chart. I didn't say anything and I waited for them to say Norman, <laughs> <laughs> but they didn't. Oh, gosh. And I just didn't say a word. And that was my secret for years, that was. So that remained in the final film? Oh, then? definitely, because yes. it was so powerful. And I love Fantastic. it. And, and the, the whole, with the breaking glass and everything, I'm very proud of that. But yeah. no, nobody take, like one of you said, it's just what people expect. You expect, yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah. What, that's, what, that's what a crusher does. But as I think of Goldfinger, I think there's a real comp complementary nature of the, some of the big sounds to deliberately take the music score out of. So the crush yeah. is in, there's no music score. So you're focusing on that oh, sound. That's right, you're right there. The same is with the odd job fight at the end. Because they oh. take out the score, all you've got is that buzzing noise of like the... Uh, the machine. The machine. Yeah, yeah. that's the bum, 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 bum. Yeah. Absolutely, <laughs> throughout well, that. that makes the but tension. that makes the tension. It's like, it's almost, it's basically the, that's the soundtrack. That's the score for that, yeah. th that scene. It's you're brilliant. so, so right. I wasn't sure about that sound, whether everyone <laughs> would approve of that, because that was the bomb, but I thought it had that bit of tension. In yeah, it. And, yeah. And people often say that was a success. Brilliant. Because you've got that noise, then you've got the, the clicking of and the... the clicking, the, the yeah. And then, did, so were you involved in the... When it electrocutes himself, that and those noises as well. Yes. Yeah, well, that's, yes. A, that's a fantastic... Well, it's a brilliant scene, isn't it? Yes. It's just very memorable. Yeah. Oh, my word. So the throwing of the hat, how did you, how on earth did you get that, that noise? Because obviously most people don't have one of those types of hats on them, do they, to, to check whether it works? <laughs> my, my metal ring I know. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I've been asked that countless times. Yeah, I yeah. can't remember all, but what I can remember is I, because of my age, I remembered a couple of toys that we had when we were little kids, you know, <laughs> yes. wartime. And I said to my assistant, I said, go around all the toy shops. I think it's very, very unlikely. But I gave him two toys. And to my amazement, he came back with them. I, I said, I don't know how you did that, because these were way, way back. But very, very simply, one of them was a disc. Sometimes they were cardboard, sometimes they were metal. And the strange way string was put through the middle was we used to hold it in our hands like this and then pull it out. And that, by pulling out the <laughs> strings... The disc spun, and it used to go. Whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. Oh. oh, we loved it. We could do all that all day. You know? <laughs> and sometimes, if it was metal, we'd try and cut something on the disc. Anyway, we took that into recording theatre and we recorded it. And the and the other one was a, a piece of metal about this long that was twisted all the way down. And then we had a little propeller that we put on the top and it, it spun its way to the bottom. <laughs> and then we used to love this. We used to push it up to the top and it flew off and it would flow all around the room, you know. <laughs> so we took that into the 
into the uh, <laughs> recording room and they followed it with the mic. Uh, they're the only two I can remember, but there were more. <laughs> and then I said, we must have something when it leaves the hand because you, you need the threat of this thing. This isn't cardboard. This is a metal hat, you know. And we tried lots and lots of things. And in the end, we, I said, I'll tell you what, get, let's get a carpenter's saw. And we got this carpenter's saw and we put it like that and we just twang the end of it and we said, yes, we got it. This doom was it left... Most people would say, well, I didn't hear anything, but I know it's there. <laughs> Many people have tried to involve themselves in my affairs, unsuccessfully. Remarkable. But what does the club secretary have to say? Oh, nothing, Mr. Bond. I own the club. I love that you're telling us that these noises are made by toys or that you recorded yeah. something on a toy on a toy recorder because it's the imagination of that. And and when we were kids and we grew up, it was that imagination that that we see on the screen and we hear that yeah. made us have this imagination for Bond oh, now. Right. It's 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 just so heartening to hear. Yes, okay. It's I'm brilliant. pleased. Yeah. But you must have such a good ear. You must have yeah. such a good ear for what I think that could sound like. Instinctively, you you feel how that sound should yes. be. Yeah. And so it, that's why when these people came from uh, the um, BBC workshop, I could tell them exactly. I could say, right, I wanted to have this, that and the other. And they'd say, fine, OK. And they would copy that. But if I hadn't said that, they'd say, well, what do you want? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's difficult, isn't it? It's and hard. that's why with the with the beam on, on the on the on bond, they made it exactly as I described it. Yeah, thin, steely sound. Yeah. Do you expect me to talk? No, Mr. Bond. I expect you to die. That's a perfect mix of music and sound yeah. effects. Two words you may have overheard, which cannot possibly have any significance to you or anyone in your organisation. Can you afford to take that chance? I mean, you're working with John Barry, aren't you? Getting at what stage does his music come in to all this? Is that well, it's, after you've put the sound? It's interesting. On? The big one of the biggest problems with films is because of the time factor. Everything is done to time. Yeah. And by the time the composer really can't really start showing an interest until the film is virtually fine yeah. cut yeah. because he can't start writing music and then you say, oh, I'm sorry, we've altered that scene a bit. Yeah. Yeah. So the problem is that the composer and the sound effects people can't come together, look at the screen and say, right, they want music on here, so how are we going to do it so that yours is, mine's heard and yours is heard? Because so often... The sound effects person would spend ages creating something and then the music doesn't go with it. So you have to decide whether you're going to have the sound effects or the music. Yeah. Usually the music won. Yes, of course. And that was could be very, very disappointing. And so one day, um, which, oh, it was on Thunderball, and he came to view, view the cut. Who did? John Barrett. John Barrett. Yeah, OK. And uh, I didn't really think much about it, but when, when it was when we finished, he came over. He said, "Norman, I'm so glad I came today." And I know what it was because when we were viewing the film, there was so much underwater that it was just silence. Yes, it was just spacing, yes. yeah. you know. Yeah. And I thought this isn't fair on people when they watch the film. And I'd already started to experiment with underwater sounds. Oh. I was slowing up. So, slowing sounds up to get the bass and that. So I found one. I thought, that's that's it. That's the one for me. So I wound it into all the cutting copy. So now at least you could hear something when you saw yeah. the stuff. John Barry came over. He said, Norman, I'm so glad. Now I know what you're doing. That's changed my mind. He said, I was going to put six trombones over that. Whoa. <laughs> And I thought, I said, John, isn't it a shame that we can't always work like this? Because it would be so much so much more professional for you to know what I'm doing and I know what you're doing, or we could discuss who's going to take over which yeah. bit, but we can't, there's no time. So that was one occasion when we really 
gained from him hearing something I was doing. Mm. Those underwater scenes are so well, the sound on those are amazing, because, again, it hasn't been done before, anything like that, has Not it? Not to that extent, no. no. I, that's the only film that I feel that it could have been sort of thought out a bit differently, really. To have so much underwater with all yeah. those bubbles and all those... <laughs> No, you didn't know where to stop and start. So, you know, in fact, I had one guy I, I brought on whose job was bubbles. Right, right. <laughs> but where do you stop and start, you know, when you've got about eight guys all yeah. going under, there's bubbles there, here, there. True. Oh, no. I, I thought it was a bit OTT myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's what a lot of people say. It was pioneering, though, and, yeah. and John's music is, we say it's the sound of underwater, it's just... It's, it does really help, doesn't it? I think. Yeah, I guess so, yes. It was just the bubbles. The you know, bubbles, the, yeah. How, how, how many to have and when not to yeah, have yeah. them. <laughs> <laughs> There's been lots of underwater footage that had to be cut down. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. the editing in that is very difficult. Yes, I imagine. yeah, you're yeah. absolutely right. Yeah. But some... it worked, you know. Oh, it did, it did. From Rush With Love, I hope you're involved in this sound, but in the pre-title sequence, it's where there's an agent you think is Bond, but it's actually the um, Spectre camp where there's a training camp, and they kill Bond, but it isn't him, and they take off his rubber mask to reveal that it is another age. Now, that noise of the rubber mask coming off is a... Di oh, I love it. I think it's brilliant. Well, I'm going to be really, really honest with you. <laughs> Please, I want to... <laughs> that was the only time in all those films they yeah. said, Norm, that's not quite up to it. They didn't, they didn't want it? No, and they, they, <laughs> they were dubbing... And I'd, I'd done in record because you know a lot of my stuff was done in a recording theatre. All the footsteps and movement and yeah, clocks yeah. and box and machines and that all, all done in the recording theatre. And I thought I'd got it right, but Peter didn't think it was right. right. And so yeah. apparently they stopped dubbing because I was still working in my cutting room. They stopped dubbing, brought something in, got and recorded it. Oh right. So you know, for oh, my sorry. sorry. No, no. <laughs> I, I, I think that's great because it proves yeah. it proves that it needed to it be needed, something yeah. that people. I agree with you. It's perfect. It's lovely, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, it's like it's almost like two movements, isn't it? Yeah. It's the only time, though, they ever criticised one of my sounds. Well, that's not bad, is it? If it's the only time, yeah. It's a good, yeah. 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 good ratio, that, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> In from Rush with Love, there's the famous fight scene on the train. Oof. Now, what, how, how was that to, to do the sound for that? Yes, that, that to me is probably one of, apart from the crushing, yes. as a scene, that's my favourite scene. Oh, it's brilliant. Yes, yeah, so that yeah. was all sh recorded in a recording theatre. Right, right, right yeah. OK. Because there are, the, you probably know this, but there are people called footsteps and effects artists. Yeah. And they're paid. We, all, you, you, we, we got to know them, you know, they were so regular. And they would come in and they would look at the screen and they could synchronise footsteps perfectly. They always knew what to put on their feet to get that sound. Of course, those theatres always had loads and loads of props, and so they'd say, well, let's have one of those and one of those. They looked at the screen. I was in the recorder with the, with the mixer, and um, it was like a team thing. And every time I saw the recording of what they'd just done, I said, wow, that's absolutely fantastic. We, we, because we had all the right surfaces we had the right doors and the right you know they're banging this and banging that aren't they but i love that scene and what was so nice for me was that there was no music mm. oh yes yeah, much yeah, better definitely. without and because yeah. the bullet went through the glass i was able to have my whistle of the train and the yeah
but it does work much better. I think fights, particularly yeah. unscored, you're really in. You feel the constraints of that small cabin, don't you, on the train? Yes. It just makes it so much more realistic. It I is think. a fantastic it scene, is. isn't it? Yeah. It's such yeah. a contrast to the Goldfinger one. Both equally brilliant. Yeah. yeah. But you, in from Russia with Love, you've got a very um, claustrophobic, frenetic fight, which is all sounds of that, you know, Russian yeah. winds and of the train and stuff. And then you've got an odd job, very slow, tense fight. Yeah. Two completely contrasting styles, oh, yeah. contrasting sounds, but both have that incredible tension in them. It's it's just brilliant. Oh. So yes. diverse. Yes, and, and you don't very often see two men in suits fighting no, each other. No, no. <laughs> not at all. It's quite a, quite a scene, uh, definitely quite a scene. You won't be needing this, old man. When you were first sort of working on all, the, particularly Dr. No, we, did you know Sean Connery? Were you thinking, looking at this footage of him, this guy's going to be a star? Did you, could you tell that this, this guy was Bond? Uh, I, I, yes. Yeah. Because people have asked, the question I'm always asked is, you, you worked on Dr. No, did you all realise that it was going to be such mm, a success? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. the answer is, no, they did not. No. Nobody had any idea. We, as far as we were concerned, it had two choices. It was either going to be a huge success or a complete flop. Yeah. Mm. And I think what it was is because the, the film was split into two halves. We knew we had a fantastic bond. We right. knew we had Ursula, which was just stunning. Yeah. We knew we had scenes like the Tarantula, which people used to, I could tell people used to go, whew. Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but how are people going to react to Dr. No? Right, this okay. character, you know, <laughs> oh, fan yeah, fantasy, yeah. fantasy character. Yeah. So we we just didn't know how the two were going to work, and and also um, Bond was a slightly light, um, not lightweight uh, spy, but you know he had his jovial moments. You know, he yeah. wasn't your usual spy, was he? No. He didn't go around. <laughs> he was just a very handsome man. You yeah. Know? I did go to a, I don't know how I ended up at a sneak preview once. And I, um, in a, we were in a cinema there, we were in the fo forecourt and Harry was there and it was a, a sneak preview. And do you know the terror on that man's face? I'd never seen him look like that. Normally he was just Harry. But he was standing there looking like this and I thought, Harry, you're really scared. And when they all filed out with a big smile on their face, oh. uh, I could tell the relief. You knew it then, yeah. Yeah, but tell, it yeah. proves just how unknown the future was of that film. Mm. And it, because it was it. different, wasn't it? When, yeah. when have you ever seen a film like Doctor No? No, no, it's true. It, it is because uh, if that went wrong, we wouldn't be here today, would we? No, it's true. you wouldn't have. There wouldn't have been from us with love. No, no Goldfinger, no other Bonds. It's just, and then here we are, sixty plus years on. It must, it must fill you with pride that. You're a part of that original. Yes, that, yes. It's the very first, and it was all created. Very, very lucky to have met Peter at the time, and he yeah. was lucky to get to get the film. Yeah. But the biggest problem on Doctor No, not only was I given my very first chance, some you know, no one had ever been promoted to that job. Yeah. F from assistant to a sound effects editor, I mean, it's unheard of. Yeah. Um, but the 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 unfairness of it all was that because of the budget. When I record, did those recordings of all those sounds, I got this phone call saying, Norman, you are costing us a fortune. This has got to stop. We can't afford it. The budget's too tight. I thought, wait a minute. It's my first time. <laughs> I'm trying to be professional, and you're telling me I've got to stop doing what I'm doing. It was very, very um, unfortunate. And it made life rather intolerant for me. And I was just fortunate mm. that I'd made all those sounds before they came to me. Right. Otherwise, I would never have done them. So when we came on to Russia with Love, I thought, are we going to go through this again <laughs> yeah, or what? Yeah. And there was a scene in the gypsy camp in oh. Turkey, all shot on the back lot at Pinewood. Yeah. <laughs> I learned from Wind Rider, the way to bring a, a scene to life is voices. He was crazy about voices, right. always having voices, all distant voices. Oh. I went into the uh, production office, tongue in cheek. He said, what do you want, Norm? I said, right, what I'm going to need, I want 10 Turkish women, 10 <laughs> Turkish men, and as many Russians as you can get. 
And he looked at the calendar. He said, Thursday be all right? <laughs> <laughs> Gosh, I didn't realise I it. couldn't believe it. Yeah. I thought, now we're making movies, you know, that's... that. And I was so grateful. I was so grateful. They all turned up, and I loved. I loved that sound, that scene. Yeah, yeah. And when we were dubbing, I, Terence stood there, and up it came. He said, "Where are all these voices from?" <laughs> Peter said, "Norman recorded them. Why?" <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. He he just couldn't believe it because the extras obviously they don't speak, do you? When you're recording a scene, all that sound has to be added on afterwards because you just need the people, the the main characters speaking. To collect the sound, don't you? Yes. Yeah, because mm. they don't want to pick up the outside any out background noise, do they? Really? And not when you're shooting. No, that's oh, to be no, added no, no. There might have been the odd, you know, bit of chatter yeah. going on, but no, basically uh, that was it. Were you involved in the the attaché case, the noises of the briefcase? Yes. Yeah. Well, they, I mean, these are these are the so expo- like, yeah. When it blew up, you yeah. mean? Oh yeah. Oh, oh yeah, talcum right. powder. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. The weather mixer was very helpful. When you're on the outside of the train and then when you're in the corridor of the train, you've got that loud rattle, rattle, rattle. When you come into the carriage, it's much more subdued. So I thought, God, have I got to keep (laughs) laying that one and then cut to another side? Uh, But he said, no, no, I think I've cracked this for you. So all he did, the moment you... I put a cue when we were going into the thing, and he just switched the tone of the took took the bass out or took okay. whatever you know. I don't know enough about the te- technology of sound, but he just altered the sound to fit the interior. So it took all that all that work off my oh. back. Oh, wonderful, <clears throat> <laughs> yeah, unbelievable. So on on to Goldfinger. We've mentioned you know the amazing work you've done on that. Mm. Could you tell us a bit about how you found out you'd been, well, first nominated for an Academy Award? How did that come about? Peter and I, I was still his assistant, and we worked on Ipcrest File. Oh, yeah, yeah. Which is one film I knew was going to be a success. Yes, yeah. And we, I was just in the recording theatre with all the guys and, and things, and Peter came in and said, uh, can I just stop you a second? He said, I've, I've received a telegram here, he said, from the Academy, and they want to know who was responsible for the sound effects on Goldfinger. So we all looked at him in surprise, and we said, well, Pete, you know that better than anybody. <laughs> and uh, he sort of didn't know what to say and walked out, and we just carried on working because we naturally thought, oh, well, they're obviously just getting some kind of a database about who worked on what and who did what on the and it was only about a couple of weeks later when I was officially told that I had been nominated for an Oscar. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and the big, biggest shock of all was that we had never heard of a sound effects award. Yeah, it, it yeah. Didn't, as far as we were concerned, it didn't exist. They'd only ever had a sound award, and that's always confusing because how do you judge yeah. who was responsible for the sound of a picture when there's so many different people yeah, yeah, have yeah. worked on it's it? It's a massive department, yeah. And I think what must have happened is the the American Guild of Editors must have said to the Academy, look, you, you really ought to introduce a sound effects award because of the amount of work that's involved in some of these films is colossal. You yeah. know? So they obviously did. And um, in 1964, they introduced it and, it, and it was won by a film called It's a Mad, 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 Mad World, which I've never seen, so I don't know what was in it. And so my wife and I said, well, obviously, we're not going to win anything, are we? So let's, let's go to the – and have a really good experience oh, of yeah. America and so on and uh, the uh, awards ceremony. But then when I arrived at my hotel, they, they gave me a, a program of the, of the event. And to my amazement, there were only two nominated. Which <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. In some ways, I was, not, I was rather disappointed in a way. I thought, this means only two of us have got the chance. Yes, it, yeah. I thought it would have been nicer if there had been four or five. But anyway, I knew then that the chances were very, very high. Mm. I had to take it seriously. Yeah. <laughs> That was the first Oscar nomination that a Bond film had had. Yes, it was, yeah. So was I presume the producers and everybody were yeah, delighted big, with Yeah, big this. celebration, surely. Yeah. 
Yes, I don't remember them <laughs> coming <laughs> over to me or doing anything. <laughs> or anything. Um, it's sort of somebody in the production office asked me to come in and he was ringing various people and saying, we've got an Oscar here, we've got an Oscar here, hoping that, that he might get a bit of publicity. Yeah. That was pretty well it, but it was a, an incredible experience and I, I really, really enjoyed it. We we were able to see some more of America while we were there. Oh, oh brilliant. brilliant, yeah, yeah. Because, I mean, everything was done so quickly. Yeah. Because I presume you had to work on Thunderball not long after. So you had some spare time to sort of go there and enjoy yes. it. That's great, isn't it? Yes, it was. Yeah. yeah. Yes. When it was the ceremony, what who who did you meet and what other what other sort of films were were in nomination? Can you remember any of that? No, I, no, I can't. People say, was it nerve wracking going up on that stage? Yeah. But the the thing was that immediately the orchestra struck up with Goldfinger. Oh, did they? Oh, <laughs> yeah. oh wow! And all the applause. And I was drowned by sound, so I just thought, well, I'm part of this. And <laughs> all can't... my, any tension vanished. It's unbelievable. Uh, and, um, and then when I got on the stage and looked out, it was something to do with the lighting. But instead of staring at individual faces looking at me, it was more like a blur. Of, yes, of, yeah. Oh. And so I, I was just talking to this blur, so I didn't have any nerves or anything. <laughs> Achievement in sound effects are... Norman Wanstall for Goldfinger, Robert L. Bratton for The Lively Set, and the winner? The winner is Norman Wanstall for Goldfinger. Ladies and gentlemen, it's very difficult to say thank you as sincerely as I'd like to now. But I'm a technician, so maybe I can leave the eloquence to the artists that follow. But on behalf of the sound departments that I've worked with and my production company and myself, may I thank you all very sincerely for this tremendous honor. And what's more, may I thank you for the opportunity of coming to your wonderful country. I think for my wife and I, this trip is going to be the greatest experience of our lives. Thank you very much indeed. John, can you get, can oh, you get the art? Here it is with, obviously, Norman's. Oh, this is incredible. Go on, um, so I can give it to you again. Well yeah. done, Norman. Oh. <laughs> we'll put the Goldfinger tune on. Go on, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll let you hold it if that's uh, all right. right okay. Yeah. 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 And it is heavy, isn't it? It is very, very heavy. Yeah. Goodness and me. What's yeah. remarkable is when you think how old that is, and it's still immaculate. It is, isn't it? It, it really yeah. is. And the irony, it's made of gold, isn't it? The, the <laughs> gold finger. The, the, final, <laughs> the final coating is gold. Yeah, yes. yeah. Well, no wonder it's last like that. Yeah. Goodness. It's me. quite interesting because when I first went on my apprenticeship at Pinewood, uh, in the main building there, they had a glass case and they had two or three Oscars, but they had worn over time. And it was so right. sad to see the surface had, was wearing yeah. off. And I. Whereas this look, nothing's happened to it. So have you not had to do anything to it? No, not no, to... nothing at all. Oh, only the bottom part there. Right. Where it actually says who is what. Look at that. And it's just you, isn't it? You know, a, a lot of the Oscars for sound now, there's about four or five people who, yeah. who win it. But it's just Norman Wanstall there. It's amazing. <laughs> uh, yes. I, yeah. I, I suppose because that's my credit. Yeah, yeah. I don't know whether all those people you're talking about had a credit? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's. I think there's two or three awards now. It's expanded for sound. There's sound mixing, isn't there? But it keeps sound. changing. Yes, and yeah. They, 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 they had this for about two or three years, then they cut it out, then they brought it back. Right. And then they introduced one for sound editing. And I thought, I feel sorry for the people that have got to yeah. nominate because they wouldn't know what sound editing means. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Can I ask, when you went back into the sound department after the Oscar, was like, the team must have been so thrilled for you. Yeah. Like, big clap or a real team effort or, <laughs> Oh, um, know. I do have a photo. I mean, I've got lots of photographs, yeah. but yeah. maybe afterwards. But I do have one with, uh, um, the whole Pinewood sound, when I say the whole, there was the head of sound, there was Gordon McCullum, of course. Yeah. Myself, 
and the man that used to do the recording in the theatre, he was the one that did the recorded that fight in the train, yeah. you know. Yeah. So we, we were all involved in sound, and, and, and so they brought us all together, and me holding that. Oh. <laughs> I could probably show it to you later if you want yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's something. It's, it is incredible, and it's it's uh, yeah. Like I say, that that's nearly sixty years old as well, isn't it? Yes. Like yeah. Yeah. And you've got, I mean, lovely photographs of it. Have you have you managed to see the ceremony again? Was it because they didn't used to show it, did they, in England then? No, no, no. And I think at one time it was it was you could never ever see anything from the past it was it was like it all went into a vault yeah and so when um i mean it was amazing really that my son was talking to a, a, someone at work and he mentioned the bonds and everything and the, the chap said oh he said my son's crazy about the bonds i can't wait to tell him and when he told him his son about the oscar this seven year old boy went straight onto youtube Right, seven yeah, years seven, yeah, Wow, yeah. and that's how it was exposed. No one knew it was on. Right, okay, yeah. So it's been sort of it's reemerged, hasn't it? All this, all this footage, and you said, just tell us a story about this. Now there's a picture above you, a lovely picture of you and your wife with the award. Oh yeah, yes. This this is this is not the picture that I have upstairs, which is the was taken at the time, and nobody knew that this picture existed. I certainly didn't. Nobody else ever mentioned it. But they suddenly, in America, put it on the market for sale. And this chap, what was his name now? Yeah, Steve Oxenrider. He said, no, I don't want someone else to have that. I think Norman should have that. He bought it and then sent it to me. Yeah, and I think lovely. that is an incredible gesture. It is, yeah. Absolutely it really incredible. Is. And how long ago was this? That that you that you were given this photograph. Oh, um, just got, it's probably now probably about four or five years. Oh right, yeah. Oh. So after all that time, it's after all that like, time, yeah. So that was a was it like a? Did you go to any after parties? Yes. Oh, did you? Oh, wonderful. Yes, we. <laughs> after the ceremony, uh, we all got into limousines and drove off to this hotel where they had you had. We were all in our part, you know, separate parties. T tables and we had uh, this very nice meal and the music was up and everyone was dancing oh. and I always said to people where my wife and I laughed was if you bumped into someone on the dance floor it was probably Gregory Peck or something. oh right yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear uh, you sort of think oh I'm sorry you know, hello oh, yeah. oh, <laughs> <laughs> did it feel like that sort of still the golden age of Hollywood when very, you were very, very much so. Yeah. I, because we were so close to the front, because all nominees obviously have less time to go up yes, onto the yeah, stage. Yeah. And while we were all waiting, you sort of looked round and virtually every face behind you was famous. Wow. Yeah. Right. Amazing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely amazing. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Quite, quite, quite an event. Yeah. Were any of the other Bond representatives there, even though they weren't necessarily nominated, or were you the exclusive like Bond representative at the Oscars? 20th Century Fox, they they looked after me. Right, and it, right. And it was their table. And ah, right. Yeah. 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 Well, it's amazing. And they, they were proud to have it on the – because yeah, everywhere, too. all the Oscars were obviously on the t uh, with the people that had won them. I could tell they were pleased to have at least one on, <laughs> on the table. Yeah. But then you had to give it back because they had to be uh, marked. Yeah. You know. It's the real, the film golfing away, the gadgets really come in. So there's the the thing he puts the tracker on his car, the thing that he puts in his heel. I don't can you remember all this. Oh, the homing device. Yeah, the homing yeah. device. Yeah, he, he takes his shoe, doesn't he, and puts it in there. And there's loads of noises like that. It's just it's just amazing. Here's a nice little transmitting device called a homer. You prime it by pressing that back like this. You see, the smaller model is now standard field issue to be fitted into the heel of your shoe. Its larger brother is magnetic. Is there a peep in the car? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Auto visual range 150 miles. Ingenious and useful too. Allow a man to stop off for a quick one en route. It has not been perfected out of years of patient research entirely for that purpose, 007. You can remember all this now. Yes, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. Well, I knew I wouldn't be able to find that peep. <laughs> so what I did, I, I found a peep. 
you know, okay. a long sound, and then just cut a piece in each time. Yeah. Just oh, is that how genius? It's done? Yeah. Genius. Yeah. We've we've noticed, I think maybe more on the the later ones, a lot of these sound effects have been repeated in more Bond films. Ah. So I know, like um, John the Glenn. Sock. Y- yeah, they lo- they love the certain sounds that there's particular screams and things like that that they like the Wilhelm scream the has been used. Hasn't pigeons it, flapping? Films. Yeah, pi- those yeah. kind of things. Yeah. And did did you use any of your sound effects again in other films? Uh, I don't think so. No. No. The the one that became overused was the jaw sock because be, sound editors tried for years to, uh, you know, to get a jaw sock that sounded right, but there was one in the library that ev- that did right. the job. Some one session somewhere in history, they did it and they said yes, great, yeah. and it went into the library and we've used everyone. But you can hear it; it's the same sound. And a lot of people said to me, "Norm, we've heard the, the same <laughs> jaw, same jaw sock in so many films." <laughs> So obviously you try according to what the, the sock is. You know, it might be on the body, it might be you right. know, on the neck, or but anything to do with the face always had that one from the library. You can you can hear it in your head now, can't you? The same, yeah. It is. It just works. Yeah. I don't know how they did it. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah, because in Doctor No as well, you've got the the silencer in the famous scene with Professor Dent. Oh. So there's gu- there's guns and things like that. Oh, by the way, that was the one I forgot to say. Yeah. That was the first sound I made with with Gordon was the silence pistol. Oh. One of the greatest scenes in all of all of the James Bond films. I mean, if that's the place you started. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, is, is, that is something else. It's a Smith and Wesson. And you've had your six. It's very in Fleming. It's Sean. He's he's absolute best there, isn't he? Yeah, really. In fact, I've, I'm I've always been amazed that we got away with it because yeah. you, a hero yeah. never kills anyone in cold blood. It's cold like blood that. is yeah yeah true. And it's and it was a was it a PG at the time? Yeah, like children could see that film, couldn't they? I think. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I think it was put under question by the censors. Yeah, yeah. The only regret I have, and it's funny actually, I've carried this with me for a long time, is that I should have made another silence pistol that was just slightly different, one that had a bit of a pew in it oh. rather than just a doo, you know. Yeah. And so that <laughs> it, they didn't always sound exactly the same. <laughs> and if in that particular scene, because he comes in and bangs, bang, 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 bang on the bed, it would have been nice if Sean's had been very slightly different. Oh, well, no, I don't. I, yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have any regrets. I, I wouldn't that, regret no. about that, Norman. Fantastic. I mean, wow. Yeah. There's explosions as well. In, in, in a lot of these films, aren't yes, they? Yes, that's all library. Goodness me, yeah. The libraries are very, very good. You know, yeah. There's so much in the libraries that you could get. What are these you have here, Norman? So, look, basically every day, I mean, they're the wrong size, aren't they? But usually every day would come in about 3,000 feet of this film. Just that would that come in. Clockwork Orange. I know, I've just seen that. <laughs> <laughs> And then, uh, th- then three thousand feet of sound. It would oh, come. Oh right, in. yeah. Right now, the assistant now has got to try and synchronise. Oh my word! Gosh. So the reason all he does is he starts from the front, and he looks and he runs it on the machine, and he can see the clapper boy there going whoa, yeah. whoa, 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 whoa. And where it touches, he marks it and writes on it twenty-eight take three. Right, bang. And then he runs this, and he hears him say. 28, take three, bang, and he marks it. So now you're in sync. That's perfect, isn't it? Yeah. So then he he would run it through one of these. Right. Right the way through until he got to the end of it, cut it off, and then he would do the next shot. Hear the clapper, time it up. So by the time he'd reached the end, he'd have two rolls all in sync. Gosh, wow. That's amazing, isn't it? all ready to take into the viewing theatre at lunchtime when you show the rushes to the rest of the crew. Wow. But without those clapper boards, you wouldn't know where to start. Right. So there is an origin to everything, all these yes. customs. and yeah. But I would think that would be a quiz question. That that only, good, one, yeah. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. only one in thousands could answer. <laughs> That's amazing. So have you, do you have any of the original reels or anything? Have you... Do they do that? Are they at the are they at Pinewood? Well, what I have got, and as you're very special people, oh, 
this is actually a married print. But the, when, when oh, the, the film two. is completely finished, yeah. the sound and picture are put on. Can you see the sound at the top there? Yeah. It's optical. Oh, my word. That is Goldfinger. Is it really? Yes. Oh, my word. Which scene's this? So as you three are rather special, I'll give you three, four frames each. Oh, no. <laughs> you don't have to. <laughs> that's, that's very kind of you, Norman. Dear yeah, it's, it's, it's Goldfinger going up. Is he's got the coat on? Is he is yeah, near the end in on. Fort Knox? Is yeah, it, is I, it that bit? I'll cut a bit off. Oh my word! <laughs> Incredibly kind. <laughs> so what I've got, basically, what I've got is a roll of film as as it comes in each day. Yeah, yeah. And that those two now can run through that machine. That's the picture, and that's yeah. the sound, and you can just move it, and you can run them singly, whichever you want to do. And right through the making of the film, these two are running side by side. The whole yeah. time. Wow. So if you want, if they say we're going to have a viewing, you go into the projection box, that goes onto the yeah. projector, that goes onto the sound machine, and then the two turn. So that's, is that how they would be shown in the cinema then as well? No, that's why you so have the, the married, married one. print. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Because that's they would amazing. have a projector that had the sound that much um, out of sync with yeah. the yeah, there's I think it's 24 frames. Well, I don't know whether you know in in the last year because to celebrate 60 years of Bond, they showed all the films in order at the cinema, and I think they'd converted them, haven't they, before yes. then to digital. Ah, but, but they, I must say that the early ones were very well the restored. Early ones, the, really, the picture was oh, fantastic, okay. and this because we've only seen them growing up on video or whatever, where the sound and all that. Was 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 okay. Seeing them on the big screen because you know obviously yeah. we were too young. Seeing Doctor No and Jamaica and all that remastering. It was, was it was just like watching a new film. Oh, you know, listening to a new film as well. It was fantastic, and it and it made you think. Gosh, this is must have been the impact in the sixties. This must have been what people were seeing. Yeah, and, exactly. And opening you up to this new world of that people were escape escapism, isn't it? Very much so. Yeah. Yes. Some people have told me that they've that they've altered the sound on one or two of them. Yeah. Well, you, Thunderball, John, you said that, that was much better, wasn't it? So, so Thunderball, yeah. I my my Blu-ray copy, the, the mixing um, levels between the dialogue and the um, score are very uneven. So the di so I have to yeah. turn it up when someone's talking and turn it down when the score's oh, on. Oh, really? Yeah. 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 It, it's, it's how it's come out on the Blu-ray. But at the cinema and the remastering, they've evened it out perfectly oh, now. Oh, wow. It makes such a difference. Yeah. That is interesting. Yeah. yeah. That is interesting. Because it is frustrating and it, it takes it away a bit when you, you've got that drop in level. Right, yeah, think, right. Yeah. Right, this is how editing rooms looked for all over the making of films, I would think up to about 16 or 17 Bonds from the 30s. <laughs> <laughs> That's what a cutting room looked like. Look at that. And this big machine that you're using, That's what's the that called? That's the Moviola. Moviola, right, yeah. Yes. Goodness On me. the continent, they had a different machine. I'm just trying to think what it was called. <laughs> and and oh, now... With digital, that's all they have is three screens. <laughs> wow. Brilliant. So the great thing about where their advantage is that if they make a cut and they think, oh, I made that a bit too this or a bit too that, they just reprogram it. Whereas here... You've made a ma major error, and you've got to either put a piece back in oh. or take a piece back out. Yeah, fantastic. Well, you, we've mentioned a few of the directors. How, how much involvement have you, did you have with them, like Terence Young, Guy Hamilton, and uh, Lewis Gilbert? I never um, became that close, and except that when all the films were over, Guy Hamilton and I used to meet at various functions. Right. Yes. And yes. I think you know with that. Not being boastful or anything, I think the Oscar had something to do. Yeah, with yeah. It. <laughs> yeah. I think he felt very proud that that was his film and not yeah, somebody course. else's. And we became sort of quite close, and we always used to single each other out and sit oh. together and stuff. Oh. And um, 
at one point, a guy called uh, Anders Freyer, who seems oh, yes, yeah, to yeah, know yeah, Anders, yeah, yeah, we do, yeah. he got to know Guy. Guy moved, I think, to an island. I'm not sure if it was Isle of Man or Isle okay. of... Or it may have been Mallorca. Mallorca, I think it was. And we had it all worked out that we were, he and I were going to go there and join him for either for his birthday or some function. And to my disappointment, the poor man passed away. Oh, right. Oh, I was really looking forward to that. Yeah. Oh, that's sad, isn't it? Yeah. But Terence, um, I mean, he knew me and I knew him, of but course, we, yeah. we never really had much chance to talk or anything. It was always Peter and Peter and him. Yeah. There's a lot, because like, there's Dick Maybaum and yeah. all these people, John Steers. Yes. They're fantastic. You know, on, yes. Because he got an Oscar for Thunderball, John, I think. He did. Yeah, yeah. Yes. After Bond, can you just tell us how, how it came to be that you, you Only Live Twice was, well, originally was your last Bond film, wasn't it? That you moved on from the world of Bond. Yes, I moved on from the world of Bonds, yes. And finally achieved my ambition to become a film editor. Yeah, yeah. The thing about the f first film I ever, ever edited, which was called Joanna, which yeah. was a... Uh, swinging 60s film and the director and the type of film meant that I didn't have to be too I could be a little bit more unconventional in the way I put the film together and I think it was noticed I, I noticed that in the critics they t two of them mentioned the editing which oh. I, I thought was rather, well, rather great, great. Isn't it? Yeah. and uh, one thing led to another in time I worked on six different films as a film editor one of them was in Egypt it was in Israel right and um, one of them was in Germany. Because you've worked with some amazing directors, and you? have worked with Richard Donner, is that right? Richard Donner, yeah. that's right. What was, what was he like? Excellent. Yeah. I really enjoyed working with the guy. Yes, he was very appreciative because what happened on that film was that he was given an editor, an elder editor, who actually was employed by the people that were making the film, if you know what I mean. I didn't quite understand it. But anyway... He obviously found that it just wasn't coming together in any way the way he had it in mind, and he was getting very concerned. The photographer on the film was also in that in that photograph. Oh, yes. He yeah. won an Oscar as well. And he was on Joanna, and he said to the director, I think there's a guy I know that would be right for you. <laughs> <laughs> And so they got in touch, and uh, I was taken onto the film, and he was very pleased that finally it was going together the way he had it in mind, and oh. it was it was it was a good relationship. I was very pleased to work on it. And which film was that? Twinkie. Twinkie, that's right. Yeah, yeah, amazing. And Anna Blackman was in it. Yes, yeah. she was. Yes, yeah, in Twinkie. <laughs> uh, and Susan George, she and yes, I got yeah. to know each other. Yeah. Was it amazing to finally be there and? Editing films, you know. Yes, it it wasn't just having the status yeah. of being more important to people and ha and being having a you know a credit to myself and everything. It was the the creative joy of putting yes. a film together, and I think it was um, I'm trying to think of the guy who said that the films were made in the in the sound in the editing department yeah, yeah. which i thought was a bit extreme because you're you're only as good as the material yeah. that yeah. they've shot but I, to some extent i know what i know what he meant but you just feel so close to it and you feel so responsible for it and it, uh, i i just love the the, 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 the actual job itself I, it really really appealed to me i always knew it would i always knew when I was an apprentice, that that was the job for me. Yeah. Well, it's amazing how you've gone all the way to yeah. do that. Yeah. It's a great story. And you, you've worked on, was it Fahrenheit 451? Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Francois Truffaut. Yes, Francois yeah. Truffaut. There's some amazing names you've worked with in your career. Yes, aren't? I felt very proud to work with him. Yeah. I, I, I let myself down a bit, really, because even though I speak schoolboy French, I. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get involved because I knew what would happen. If I started to use a bit of French, he was going to rattle away. Yeah, and, yeah, would, yeah, yeah. and uh, I would be embarrassed. <laughs> when he first arrived here, we were told that the only English he knew were the titles of all the, French, all the English and American films he'd seen, loads and loads of them. So he remembered all the titles, but he couldn't speak a word of English. <laughs> and so um, they said, 
when he first turned up, they, they said two or three of us, take him round the studio and show him all the different uh, departments and all the rest of it. And every department we took him to, he said, mm, 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 mm. You'd done A Warm December, is that right? With Sidney Poitier? Yes. Yeah, yeah. That was the probably the happiest film of, of my career. Oh, right. Wow. Oh, brilliant. Okay. For the moment we got together, I don't know what it was, but somehow we bonded. And yeah. I liked the man so much. And not only that, but for some reason, we reached the point where every time there was a decision to be made, I, mean, I was only the dialogue e right. e uh, editor. I wasn't the editor and I wasn't the, it was the American editor. But whenever there was a decision, he used to say, Norm, what do you think? <laughs> Norm, what do you think? I Aww. used to think, this is amazing. This is Sidney Poitier yeah, watching yeah. my decision. I think I know what it was. There was a very young girl in the film she was only about 13, and my responsibility was doing the post-synchronizing. Yeah. And it, they said that she'd never done any before and uh, that, uh, that would I make sure that she understood exactly what was necessary and so on and not make her nervous. And while we were doing it, the American editor came in for some reason. He just I, I was aware that he'd come in and he was watching, and I was aware that he also walked out and uh, didn't think any more about it. Pembroke, his name was, but we all called him Pem. And a couple of days later, I walked, went into one of the uh, uh, viewing theatres for some reason, and there was no one in there. And he, he looked, at, looked across and he said, Norm, come here. And I thought, what was all this about then? And when I got to him, he was about that much from my face that he said, <laughs> Pam says you're the best fucking sound colour that walks. <laughs> That's great, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> oh, dear oh well done, yeah. Some of the funny sides of filmmaking. Yeah. <laughs> we have to mention Never Say Never Again, because I, I didn't know until recently that you returned to Bond. With yes. This. That's amazing. Well, I'd, I'd left the industry, but uh, I hadn't yeah. been gone that long, but then... The editor was American on that film, and, but his assistant was a friend of mine. And he rang me one day and he said, I said, oh, how's it all going? He said, well, he said, Sean's not really that happy. You know, he misses the old days when it was like a family and yeah. the same oh, yeah. people on each film. He said, I, he's, he's not really that content anymore. And uh, we wondered if you would consider coming back. And I said, well, I d I've never met Sean. He said, I know, he said, but he knows about you. Oh. And just to have someone back from the old days, I'm sure would. Uh, and I said, well, yeah, it's a big decision for me. And I spoke to my wife and she said, well, you're nothing to lose, really. You'll make a few bob. But yeah, so, yeah. So anyway, I decided I would, especially as he was my friend. Yeah. But from then on, I don't think it was a very happy film at all. There was a guy who had come from America that was dealing with the money side of it, and he, he there was something about him. He, he could eat very easily split people, and I knew the people that were editing the film, but we were beginning to fall out, and I knew it was always this guy that was causing it. What really was surprising was when the film had finally been, been assembled and we all went into the theatre to see it, when it was finished, it went very quiet, and... <laughs> The one of the writers said, "Okay, why did why did Bond go to the Bahamas? What?" And we all said, "Yes, why did he go?" <laughs> there was a fault in the script. There was no scene that explained ah. why he had ah. decided to go to the Bahamas. Right, that is fascinating. Is that in the final edit? That was in the, no, it wasn't the final. Oh, it, right. That was the first assembly. But right. the fact was, they didn't have. I mean, they stopped shooting. All the crew had yeah. gone and yeah. everything. I, I'm not sure how they got round that. We'll have to watch it again to, 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 to try. And, yeah, I know yes. you mean. When, is it just cuts to it and you don't know? I'm not sure. Why he's there that, I'm not sure if somebody spoke over someone's back or what. Yeah, yeah, they do. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, did you ever get to meet Sean? Like, obviously, because you were coming back on as a, a face of familiarity, did they ever introduce you to him? Well, all that happened was that um, we, we were outside my editing room, and the editor was with Sean, and I he, he called me, and there were the three of us standing there, and I was aware of Sean sort of looking me up and down, and I spoke with the editor for whatever it was he wanted to say. 
So then we split, and to my amazement, Sean came into my room. Aww. And I think both of us thought that it was time to say, we've worked together on all these films and we've never been introduced, were, were, were. But it didn't actually sort of happen. I don't know why, it just didn't, it didn't happen. So you were there with him, but you, yeah, you just didn't, I, didn't He seem came to in say. and we were... Yeah, yeah. The, Oh. And I could tell he wanted to speak and chat, and I wanted to as well, but I don't know what happened there. Yeah. It, it didn't. But both suddenly very shy. Right, <laughs> yes. Oh. Well, I'm sure he obviously... But the fact that he came in meant meant something, you yeah. know. He'd obviously heard about me, and he'd, he wanted to get a little bit closer. Yeah, he obviously appreciated yeah, all the work definitely. you'd done on his, on his films. but Probably, yeah. yeah. So that was the last film you did, wasn't it? Yes, it, it yeah. was. Yeah. I don't really... I, I don't know really what they thought the point was of remaking a film so soon, you know, yeah, all that yeah, underwater yeah. and then, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> I think we prefer Thunderball, don't worry. Well, yeah. I mean, I mean if if you look at the, um, all the chat between the Bond boys on Facebook, that they never mention Never Say No. No, no. Never mention it. I think partly because it was a sort of, you know, the rights issue and they tried to make a rival Bond film. Because it came out at the same time as Octopus. Yeah, it's, you're right. Which, uh, which yeah. we love, that film. Well, Octopus yeah, is a yeah. brilliant film. <laughs> oh, yeah. That was fair enough. Yeah. So in terms of your... Tragic, Bond, really. Yeah, well, yeah. What, who, who's your favourite? I mean, I assume your favourite Bond is Sean, I'm, I'm assuming. Yeah, like, yeah. like I would think 85% of the yeah. Bond fans. Yeah, well, you know, it's, it's incredible, really, that even though it's a long time since he was Bond... Young young people growing up now still look back and yeah, think, they, yes. he's the original, wasn't he? So yes, it does help. he was. Yeah, I mean, there are people that don't pick Big Sean, and I think probably it was because they grew up with a different Bond, Correct. and that to them was Bond. Yeah. I should think Roger's got loads of loads of. Fans. Oh, he does. Yeah, yeah. When you think how many he was in, you know. Yeah, yeah. How I thought ca- Piers Piers oh. had a lot going for him. Great. Oh, oh, brilliant! Oh, thank brilliant. you. Yeah, because he's not got as much love as l- lately. It's nice to hear that you've you've appreciated. Yeah, it. I respected the guy because you could believe him as being that kind of person in that yeah, film. Yeah, it's just that towards the later ones, he he was becoming looking a little bit on the old side. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Roger was as well, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. And you've seen them all, haven't you, up until No Time to Die? Yes, yeah. all of them. And Quantum of Solace was an absolute disgrace. In fact, <laughs> I did write. <laughs> I did write to the to the makers. And did you? Yeah, I did. I said, you know, this is this is absolutely inc- incredible. That it had it been any other film but a Bond, that would have been put shelved and or recut or done something. Yeah, yeah. Never would it have been shown in that state. My word, this is brilliant, Norman. It was an amazing interview. Anyway, <laughs> it's now the greatest interview. <laughs> I couldn't agree more, but there we go. Sorry. No, it is. The, it's famous because the, apparently it was all rushed, wasn't it? There was the writer's strike. Yes, yes, but there's but, no excuse. No, it isn't. No, because you you had a year between films, didn't you? Each yeah. one. Yeah. You know, you had to get it all done with. That's right. With less money. Yeah. And uh, you know, more pressure, really. I mean, that's it. Is amazing, isn't it? It really was amazing. Yeah. I mean, to have a car chase at the start where you have no reason to have it. No, you're watching this car yeah. chase, and you think, so what? A car chase is always after a fil- after a scene that yep. spurs it on. Yep. But no, absolutely. <laughs> no, what thank what you. do you think Peter Hunt would have made? And of the, the cutting of the <laughs> fights. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> it's a completely different style, isn't it? Yes, yeah. because the, uh, what's so serious about it is that the producer's job is not just to hire people; it's to have control over yeah. the movie. And they should have said, well, whoa, 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 you know, what's happening here? We don't cut fight scenes like that because there's no, there's no t- tension in it at all. Mm. It's too fast. You don't know what's happening. It, yeah. It, the, the tension in a fight is when you've got those moments when someone's, you know, held there and you're not sure which way it's yeah, going. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, all chopped to ribbons. Unbelievable, really. You're speaking to quite a lot of Bond fans who... Who felt the same way? I yeah, think. I'm yeah. sure. But for me to write to them, and yeah, and I said it very gently. I said, I believe I have been told. I've just come back from abroad. I've been told that uh, certain certain uh, journalists walked out of the preview. You know, right. oh, wow. Yeah, they did. Did you ever get a reply? No. Right. No, no reply. Well, 
Yeah, so what do you think Peter Hunt would have made of... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, wow. But then you were telling us that you uh, you went to the Spectre premiere, didn't you, a few years later? Yes, yes. Strange, really, because we were put very, very close to the screen. So, one, it was in my face, oh, and right. the other was the sound. Was I could feel it all trembling at right. right. my feet. And, and uh, to me, it was just another film. I, I didn't cu come away thinking it was any more than just a f another yeah, Bond yeah. film. Mm. I began to think perhaps they were running out of ideas. Well, <laughs> hmm. and, what, and what did you think about No Time to Die? Oh, yeah. No, I, 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 I couldn't understand quite what, what was going on there. Quite extraordinary. So much chat, so little action. I mean, from the... You had some action at the start that was a yep. bit outrageous, you know, screeching cars doing silly things at a town. <laughs> and then it all stops, and, and then it all becomes dialogue for so long, yeah. and the villain doesn't arrive until three-quarters of the way through the film. Yeah. Oh, absolutely extraordinary. <laughs> absolutely extraordinary. Craig Kate is real. <laughs> well, were you, were you all right with Bond dying at the end? Was that, was that okay? I couldn't quite see what the point was, really. I... I thought, well, you must have had a reason for doing that. Mm. Have you any idea what you think their reason is? <laughs> <laughs> I think it was Daniel Craig, his idea, wasn't it? It may be the end of his Bonds, but it's not the end of the Bonds no, sequence, no. is it? Absolutely. So. It'll come back, of course, and we're, we're, look, we're still looking forward to the next, who will be cast and what direction they go in. Yes. Yeah, it'll be interesting. I expect a lot of audience will expect some kind of scene to explain how yeah, he's yeah, come I back. Know. <laughs> <laughs> It's it. I think as us Bond fans, well, well, they'll just do. They'll just pretend it didn't happen. But a lot of the general audience will be like, "I thought he died." But I think they, they will. I thought, think yeah, that. I thought yeah. he died. Yeah. <laughs> but Craig's first film in, in yes, Russia yes. is the is the finest of all the Bond films. Right. Good. Well, okay. that's, I was yeah. going to ask you, do you still like Daniel as as Bond? Yes, I think he's getting. It was getting a little bit old for the part, yeah. but nevertheless, you know, he he was right. Good. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. But that first one, I, I always forget the title again. Casino Royale. <laughs> yeah, Casino Royale. Yeah, a very good film. It was brilliantly directed, a very good script. Yeah. Had everything going for it and a brand new a brand new Bond, which yeah. I think it came just at the right time. Yes. The, the, the series was just beginning to get a little bit tiresome, I thought. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it really benefited from having, obviously, an original Fleming material as well, didn't it? Yes, yeah. yes. You, yes, exactly. Because when you first started, Ian Fleming was still alive, wasn't he? Yes. Did he? Did he ever? How, how often was he at Pinewood? And was he? Was he around? Oh, there were lots of pictures with him. You know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, someone like Graham Rye would be able to show you yeah, loads of yeah, pictures yeah. of of him. You know, coming to the set and things like that. I I never saw him, but yeah. oh yeah, that was something, wasn't it? To see his books being put into yeah, into yeah. reality. Oh. Because you, were you a fan of the the books? Had you read any of them before you? I did. I hadn't actually. No, no. no. In fact, I haven't. Re I think I only read one. Right. Which one? Can you remember which one that was? No, I can't. <laughs> no. It wasn't Quantum of Solace short story? Was it, <laughs> <Yeah. right? laughs> oh dear. You do have an amazing legacy of Bond that yeah. very very few can can match. And I know you've moved on to lots of other things in your life. You know, we've haven't talked about your second career, and you know you. Out here in the countryside now, it's, it's but it's to look still, back on. I still love film though. Yeah, I, films yeah. where your heart is. Yeah, I it. go to everything that's worth seeing. I go to see. Yeah. Which great. Just listening to some of the opinions on the the latest Oscar contenders is fascinating. Yeah, because you you'll have a different sensitivity to it and yes. a different way of looking. Well, I was good, we're going to ask actually. What when you see a film, how much can you? Are you always listening to the sound on it? Specifically, not 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 necessarily just the sound, but you do find for the first few minutes that you're analysing it. You're analysing the, uh, uh, the the reality of the acting, yeah. um, whether the storyline is quite what you thought it was, and sound doesn't really come into it because usually it's dialogue. And uh, my hearing, unfortunately, isn't what it used right, to be, okay. and I, I struggle a bit, unfortunately, to hear. It's just the, it upsets me when I go to the cinema. I'm always straining to. Oh, okay. hear what they're saying. Mm. But no, not generally. 
So you can you can sit back and enjoy the film though. Yes. Yeah, yeah you could. That's yes. good. Yeah. Well, that's that's the big thing. If I can sit back and enjoy the film, it means it's my kind of movie. Yes. Yeah. But s some films, I because I'm at home, I don't watch television like most people do. But I do like films, and yeah. so I go on Netflix, try ah. and find a title, <laughs> put it on. Within ten minutes, I think, no, no, off it goes. Oh right. <laughs> <laughs> It's very, very rarely that I see one right through. I don't know why, they just don't seem to be me or my theme or my time. Yeah, yeah. Final question, Norman. Which Bond film that you've worked on are you most proud of? Oh, the one I'm most proud of? I think it probably has to be Dr. No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, we can't <laughs> yeah. disagree with that because it's just <laughs> unbelievable. Yeah. Oh. It's so good. Oh, thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, George. Yeah, there's a lot in it, yeah. Yeah. It's strange because um, what you can't, if you've worked on a film, you can't really watch it because it's, you're, you know, the whole thing yeah. is, is you were there when it was there. So, yeah. But years later, give Gareth his due, when it was the 50th anniversary, he had this event at Pinewood and obviously he was going to show a bomb film and he had the sense to say, well, the best thing is to show Dr. No because that was the start of yeah, the whole 50. Yeah. And do you know, I sat back and I, I was able to be objective. Instead of yeah. analysing it, I just sat back. And do you know, I could see why it was a success. Yeah. I, I found myself getting quite tense in places. Yeah, I thought, no, yeah. come on. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that said it all. That proved to me why it was the success it was. Yeah. yeah. Very rarely you can do that. It was only because it was 50 years later. That <laughs> yeah, yeah. It took that long to appreciate it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Thank Norman. you so much. I think I admire you all for, you for being Bond fans, you know. Yeah, well. Taking the trouble to get involved in them. Oh, we, we, we're them. in love with them and we I think we always will be. You know? always will be. I think it's partly because as children we yeah. were brought up with them and our, my dad was like Bond and he, he saw them in the 60s, you know, at the cinema and I think that love has continued through all of us. And yeah, oh, We'll enough. show our kids the Bond films and hope hope they like them as much as we do. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes. And, yeah. and, and Roger's fine for you, is he? Oh, yeah. We, we yeah. love them yeah, all. You, I, I know it's, it's very different to how it started yes. and all that, but I think... For the audience at the time, it's what they wanted, isn't it? A right. bit of a different. Fair enough, yeah. And I dare say they might go back to that more light-hearted now. I don't know. We'll, we'll have to see. Yeah, the next it would bomb, be sad it? if they did, wouldn't it? Yeah. Well, they, I don't know. You never hear anyone say they should go back to the Sean, but I don't think anyone would complain with that, would they? I wouldn't have thought so. No. He just had a way of doing it. When he yeah. said... I think they were on their way to a funeral. But yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. That look was so subtle. Yeah. Because he doesn't overact, does he? No, yeah, he's no. He's restrained no. and oozes charisma and yeah. presence, doesn't he? Yeah. And I always remember, uh, I can't always remember which film it is, when he is, the film starts with him setting up that bomb, bomb in that building. Oh, Goldfinger. Oh, I think it's Goldfinger, is it? And then he goes to that bar or wherever yeah, it yeah. is. Yeah, Goldfinger. In the white dinner jacket. Oh, yeah. And is he standing there when it explodes in the back? Yeah, yeah. Yes. And now the look on his face. That's... None of the other Bonds would even begin yeah. to be able to have done that look. I agree. Because <laughs> you can't teach that, can you, really? You can't, no. no. It's that, and he just he lights his cigarette, doesn't he? And it's just, just incredible. so cool. Yeah. Checking yeah. his watch, just like, yeah, yeah it's <laughs> brilliant. That was me who did that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've never forgotten that look. Oh, that's Bond, though, isn't it? That, it is well, Bond. That's what made Sean such a good Bond, really. Yeah. It's the original. Yeah. He's, he's not my personal favourite, but I will always say he's the best. I think he is the yeah. best James Bond. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Oh, who's your favourite? Timothy Dalton. Oh. Yeah. 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 But I love them all. I do. We yeah. do, yeah, we do. Yeah. Yeah, he never came over to me as a special agent for some reason, but Who Dalton or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dalton. No. <laughs> Cut this short, we don't want yeah, any yeah. slits. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only joking. I, I was very surprised that Peter Hunt accepted, uh, what's his name for? Oh, Majesty. George. Yeah, George Lazenby. <sighs> <laughs> In the history of films, I bet you cannot find one film where the star was an act, someone who'd never acted. Yeah, yeah. In such 
a pivotal film yeah. where you're coming after Sean Connery. Yeah. I know, and it shows too. I yeah, mean, do you, <laughs> David, you do you want him? to take over? <laughs> oh, you... funny enough, I did. I did meet him very briefly. Yeah. We they used to have these events at Pinewood. I used to enjoy them actually, yeah. and they used to invite people that have worked on it. And lots of fans, so that they could have signed things and everything, and the actresses and that. And he and I were on this table, and it, and it, my wife was very, very seriously ill. Oh right. And someone must have mentioned it to him, and he and I, you know, looked across and did a bit of this and that. And then he passed me this bit of paper, and he'd written on it, "Whatever happens is what was meant to be." And I thought oh. that's a very, very gentle way of. Putting it really, oh, bless and him, I, yeah. I said, "Well done," you know, and That's oh, showed it to my wife. Oh, bless her! Yeah, <sighs> but he's tried to make a future for himself. But <laughs> 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 yeah, and it's interesting to me that Peter never directed another one. Yeah, that, that well, means something must have gone wrong. But he, we think he was a brilliant director. He's amazing, as well as an editor. He was a brilliant director. Yeah, he amazing. was. Yeah, but it's not another Bond. Yeah, you thought he would have carried on the oh, series. Yeah. We'd have loved more. Loved more. I wonder what went wrong there. Yeah. But now, like fifty years later, it's seen as the pivotal Bond film. It's seen as yeah. the film that people aspire to remake and stuff. Yeah, they really. And it's love the it. direction of it. That is the big thing, like well, on a Majesty. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. It's, yeah. It's Some the... people say it's the Bond film, don't they? Yeah, yeah they, they do. really do. I know. Yeah, I, do, I, I feel bad because I think he died before it had fully yes. come back. To everyone said it's a masterpiece before he died. Uh, after he died, you know, and I don't know whether I, I hope he knew that. I hope he, I hope knew, he knew how, right. how well thought of it was and how well he'd done on it. I wonder what. I wonder how that happened. Yeah, I don't. But you know, we've all got our own opinion and reaction, yes. so you can't really keep. Cro commenting really yeah but obviously there have been certain common levels here <laughs> yes yeah yeah of course <laughs> no, th yeah, thank, thank you so much, so Norman. much yes. Norman. We've, we've loved it and yeah. it's been uh, well an honor to meet you it really has yeah. You can hear loads of our other episodes on iTunes, Spotify and our YouTube channel where we have interviews, special episodes and reviews of all the Bond films. Simply search Really 007 Pod and you should find loads of weird and wonderful content. Remember, you're only president for life. <laughs>